Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. Thank you so much for joining. Um, my name is Kate. I am the webinar host at iMotions for this webinar. We have a huge packed program today, so I'm going to just kick right into it. But before we uh, introduce our speakers, we have um, a question box here on the left side of your screen. You'll see a, a cutout. If you have questions for our presenters, please put them into the Q&A box there and we will be able to answer them during the Q&A. We are going to run through our presentation, but we'll be aggregating questions during so that you'll be able to have them ready for um, our presenters. And then also this webinar is being recorded and it will be sent to all registrants, regardless of whether you're attending right now or if you have to drop er off early or if you couldn't make it, if your colleagues, for example, wanna see it tomorrow, but they couldn't come today, everything will be available to them in your email tomorrow. So I hope that's clear for everyone. But without further ado, I would like to present our agenda and our speakers for today. So um, we have MD-PhD Mikhail Wagner. Uh, he is going to present his remote eye tracking study for neonatal training. This is the reason for this webinar. You're going to hear about his really interesting study, bringing eye tracking glasses into neonatal training um, in actually directly in a hospital um using the viewpoint system vps19 glasses so we have victoria zikova, zikova here she is the senior development uh, business development manager at viewpoint system so she's going to introduce as well um, some of the more technical facts about the viewpoint system glasses we also have paolo masuri here he is the lead data scientist here at imotions and he is going to talk about adding additional data streams onto uh, glasses data as you're taking eye tracking glasses data into um, the system of iMotions, which I will present in a second. Um, so everyone can wave and say hi. We'll have them introduce themselves when they start their presentation. But just a little bit of background on who iMotions is, and then I'll talk a little bit about who Viewpoint System is before we get into the actual case study from Dr. Wagner. Uh, iMotions has been around for almost 17 years. We were founded in Boston in 2005 and we have offices globally, as you can see here. So we are dedicated to helping clients execute their human behavior research. And that can mean anything from UX to performance and training, uh, medical training in this use case, uh, university research, anything that has to do with human behavior research. Um, what does that actually mean? This is basically biosensor research as a way of investigating the physiological signals that our body sends when we have some sort of emotional or physiological reaction to stimuli or an environment or any sort of um, you know a video a tv show an image we are able to track the biosensor data input that we can get from for example eye tracking um, electroencephalography through brain activity also things like galvanic skin response which you can see on the right which is um, an interaction of sweat activity from your sweat glands on your hands um, and a bunch of other sensors. So what iMotions does is we streamline all of that research into one platform. So we can take data signals as they're coming in through the different sensors where we're tracking um, your physiological signals, and then we connect them and synchronize them with the timestamp. So we also have a ton of really great uh, analysis and export options so that you can transform your data and bring it into your, your research and go basically get faster to your publication stage, which is Researchers love that. So uh, we're synchronized in one platform and we also have tons of support and technical um, expertise on hand on our staff. So we are always available to help you. So we power some of the labs here, both academic and commercial labs. Um, you can see the sort of split of all the just sort of research areas that we're in. Um, but I don't wanna dwell on that too much because we also have another um, co-host of this webinar here today, which is Viewpoint System. Uh, they are the makers of the VPS-19 glasses that you're going to hear about in the study that Dr. Wagner used. So um, they were founded six years ago in Vienna and they have their headquarters there. And um, they have more than 100 clients in over 15 industries. Um, so uh, spanning across the sort of like the gamut of application areas as well. Um, and since 2022, they are the first year supplier of eye tracking sensor technology called Digital Iris Inside. So um, that's super exciting too, a new development from these really great glasses. Um, yes, yeah, so I am going to actually present uh, Dr. Wagner's study here. I'm gonna give him presenter rights now and he can introduce himself. And um, I'm gonna turn my camera off as well and we'll just focus on Dr. Wagner so we can hear all about his really interesting eye tracking research. 
So um, Dr. Wagner, I will give you panel access right now and here you go. Thank you so much. Okay, hello everyone. I hope you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect, thanks. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. I'm really happy to uh, that I got invited to this webinar. And my name is Michael Wagner. I'm a neonatologist at the Medical University of Vienna. And I'm also responsible for the Pediatric Simulation Training Center here. And uh, for my PhD, I used eye-tracking glasses mainly to study visual attention of healthcare providers. So this topic is uh, virtual bedside teaching and remote video-based reflection on neonatal interventions using eye-tracking glasses. So first I would like to give you a short overview of what our simulation center looks like. So we have different kind of mannequins, we have audio video systems to record the sessions. Uh, and here on the left upper picture, you can see how we do a debriefing with um, using the videos. We also use eye tracking videos here, for example, and uh, the vital monitor of the patient. And we discuss the situations usually later on. We also do trainings in situ. So we take our simulators, go to the real environment. Uh, we take the real equipment, the medication, uh, lines and the patient monitor. And we use a mobile audiovisual system, sometimes also only eye tracking classes to record this situation and to do trainings in situ as well. Uh, we also do a lot of student training, so uh, interprofessional student training. We have medical and nursing students, put them together in a training so that they can learn how to work together as a team uh, and to learn about human factors such as teamwork, communication, task allocation before they even start working in real life. So we do about 219 trainings a year with uh, about 1,700 participants per year. And we have diff uh, a lot of different simulation-based trainings. So we do high fidelity team trainings, we do low fidelity skill training, like um, putting in lines into the babies, airway management, basic life support, newborn life support, uh, students, student training, surfactant training, so uh, a lot of different training opportunities at our center. So two years ago, the uh, coronavirus came into our world and our daily life, and we also had the problems that due to the corona pandemic, we had to reduce training opportunities and uh, also to reduce bedside teaching because students and healthcare professionals were not allowed to go next to the patient uh, because of the social distancing measures. So although it was pandemic, I had the possibility to go to Leiden uh, University. And that was pretty helpful because uh, the team at Leiden, they're doing video recording since about 10 years now. So they are recording every neonatal life support. So when a baby is born afterwards, they're recording it together with vital parameters. So you see saturation, heart rate, you see the ventilation quality, and they do weekly audits. So the whole team is sitting together. And um, usually the team that was doing the neonatal life support is adding some context for the others. And usually they discuss first the top, so what went really well, and then the team is discussing tips for everyone, like what can we do better the next time? Did we have any problems with the, with the equipment? And someone is summarizing the lessons learned and setting it out to the whole team, so also for those who didn't have the chance to participate. So they also published the, the provider's perspective on these video recordings and weekly audits. And what, what the provider thought about it is that it's really cool because usually uh, there are not so many resuscitations, for example. And uh, during, during your medical education, you sometimes see like one or two uh, because you're not always on call. So with this video recording system, you now have the possibility to see what others are doing, to learn from others, and to also get feedback for the things you are doing. So the feedback from the providers on the topic is really or was really positive. 
But the problem was the system only worked directly after birth, so for neonatal life support, because they had a camera there. But it's different uh, or more difficult in other situations, so for other neonatal interventions. So for example, um, for example, for neonatal intubation, for surfactant administration, for umbilical lines, for central venous catheters. So um, as I was working with eye tracking classes for a few years in, a re in research settings, I thought, okay, so as, as the team already had a really good experience with video recordings and video reflections afterwards, it would be really nice <clears throat> to take the eye tracking classes uh, because you're mobile with it, you're more flexible, and see if we can use eye tracking classes to uh, record different neonatal interventions at the bedside. So that's what we did in that study. We published this in a, in a um, high scientific journal and we had two different participants. We had the proceduralists, so the people wearing the glasses, and the observers, so the people watching the or recordings in real time or later on. So again, to summarize, the problem we had is due to the social distancing into, uh, measurements, we had uh, the bedside teaching was decreased worldwide. And uh, we used the new technology, eye tracking glasses, to record a point of view perspective of providers to do a kind of virtual bedside teaching. So we had two different situations. So on the one hand, real-time streaming. So it was, it's possible with uh, the VPS system to do a real-time streaming to another room or to people working from home. Uh, and or, you, or the other situation would be that you do the recordings uh, and then you use the recordings later on for a cold or warm debriefing uh, with the team also, again, with the possibility to stream it home to others that are in quarantine or working from home. So we, the objectives were to see um, if it was possible for supervisors to guide providers while keeping social distance, to, um, to um, study the experience of first-person perspective for other trainees, so for the observers, and to see if we can improve quality of care by reviewing this uh, point of view recordings. So uh, some facts about the study, it was a prospective single center study at Leiden Medical University. Uh, they have a single room NICU there and it was from September to November 2020. So again, we had two different groups. So the procedural, proceduralists wearing the glasses and the observers watching the video recordings. Uh, in total, uh, as this was a pilot study, we included 10 patients with a median gestational age of uh, about 31 weeks and a weight of 1,700 grams. Uh, we had multiple diagnoses like asphyxia, prematurity, respiratory distress syndrome, double outlet right ventricle, or transposition of the great arteries. So this is the classes we used, uh, VPS-19. Uh, from viewpoint system, I don't want to get into too much details about uh, the technical aspect because you will hear it later on, but uh, it worked really well and uh, the classes are really lightweight, so I think that's a good advantage. So this is a short video to, for you so that you can see how the classes can be used. So they are in a box and they are consisting of two different parts. So you have the glasses, you connect them via, uh, via USB-C to the recording unit, which we'll, you will see in a moment. So this is the recording unit, you connect it via USB-C and there is an additional battery, uh, which you can plug in. Okay, so you have the possibilities to um, to do a live streaming, as you can see here, to connect to the Wi-Fi or to um, 4G and LTE. And you can do just recordings without eye tracking or you can do eye tracking. And if you want to use eye tracking, you need to calibrate the glasses. So for this, you need to hold the recording unit 
in front of you and do the calibration on five different points, as you can see here. Okay, and once you did the calibration, you can move on to do the recordings. Uh, this is what the recording looks like. You will see another one a little bit later on, just to give you a short, um, so that you can already see what it looks like. So it's a first person perspective and the white circle indicates the visual attention and the focus of the provider. So the interventions we recorded were neonatal intubation, central venous catheters, umbilical lines, peripherally inserted central catheters, uh, pleural punctures, lumbar punctures, neonatal resuscitations, affecting administration, and we even were, um, were uh, able to record epin, uh, surgeries on the NICU. So these are the recordings we now do and did at the medical university. So when I come, came back from Leiden, I tried to translate all the knowledge I gained there to, to Vienna. And now we are doing regular video recordings with eye tracking classes. Uh, and this is, uh, these are all the recordings we, um, we were able to, to record so far. So uh, we used the recordings then in that study, in the other study, to do video reflections. So we did a total of nine video-based reflections with 88 participants, some uh, in, this, in, the, in the same room where we watched the videos, some at home watching the video from there. And everyone in the NICU was invited to join. So the physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, and so on. And during the, re the recordings, again, as in the other video reflections, we discussed the, like, the tops and the tips. So what went well and what can be improved the next time. And uh, if a video laryngoscope was used, we also, um, we also integrated that recording to the eye tracking recording. Um, so again, this is like the situation uh, where you can also use eye tracking for like a remote consulting. So you have someone you, wearing the glasses in the smart unit and you could, can do an, a secure direct stream to another computer and students or supervisors can watch it. And eye tracking classes can also measure visual attention. Uh, it's uh, possible to do a kind of virtual bedside teaching, remote education. And uh, as you also have a direct link and can communicate with each other, you can also guide inexperienced healthcare providers. Okay, so this is now a video uh, for you so that you can see what uh, this, what's, what a neonatal intubation looked like. So we have to put that um, uh, patient, we have a video laryngoscope in the front. And again, the white circle indicates the visual focus. And as you can see here, uh, the setting was not ideal because the provider always had to look over his left shoulder, uh, kind of also like a little, little bit distracting uh, the provider from the patient. And so we discussed it in the video debriefing and later on the, we decided that the provider should be on the other side of the bed to better see the patient and the monitors at a glance. Here's a video of a surfactant administration. So again, you can really see first person perspective is really nice because we can see what the provider is seeing uh, and it just makes you feel like you're doing it yourself. So uh, for the results, so what we identified is that for the proceduralists, so the people wearing the glasses, nobody removed the glasses. They all thought that it's really nice and feasible to use them. It was not, uh, uh, there was not really a discomfort. It was not distracting them. Uh, so uh, a lot of them say, say that they will use it again. And so for the observers, people watching the videos, they said it's really nice, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic for virtual bedside education. Uh, they were not distracted by the first person view. They thought it's an additional educational experience. And we got some qualitative feedback to improve logistical issues, equipment, medication, and uh, awareness on specific situations. So the key findings were that it was feasible to use eye tracking for point of view recordings and also 
uh, for doing debriefings later on with the recordings uh, to discuss neonatal procedures. And uh, it was very feasible to, and, and also an educational benefit to see this first person view. And uh, especially to see the, the gaze behavior of the providers was, uh, what was discussed as being very beneficial because you can really immediately see what areas they, they identify uh, in critical situations. And we really think that eye tracking and the classes have the potential <clears throat> to improve specific situations, to improve virtual teaching, and it can close the gap for learning neonatal procedures. <clears throat> so future projects um, is to involve a student or to, in, in the medical curriculum, to include this virtual bedside teaching in the medical curri curriculum. Uh, we would like to have weekly team debriefings with such recordings and also to enable real-time streaming also for remote consultations. One more project we did is because we do a lot of, as I said before, a lot of student trainings and we were not able to do them anymore during the pandemic. We again used eye tracking glasses for that uh, situation. So we gave to the students um, guidelines beforehand and they were able to watch a situation where a team leader was wearing the glasses uh, in a situation that went really bad. So there was no good communication, no good task allocation. The team leader had no overview of the situation. So they could experience from a first person perspective uh, what, uh, how um, a really bad situation can be like. And then uh, some, some in situ and some remotely uh, discussed the video and on a virtual whiteboard we discussed like what, what's important for teamwork, what's important uh, for patient safety. And after that discussion, we gave them again a video from a first person perspective from a team leader that was handling the situation really well, like standing next to the bed, getting a good, good overview, communicating good with the team and uh, just to give them a feeling of how such a situation should look like. Yeah, that's basically it. And I'm very looking forward to hear your um, questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wagner. Super interesting stuff. Um, we already have some questions coming in actually, but I'm gonna hold them for the Q&A because we are going to switch over to our next presenter who's gonna talk a little bit about how you would take that data um, that Dr. Wagner showed through the eye tracking glasses and actually bring them into an iMotions platform and synchronize them with additional data streams. So I'm just gonna change the presenter again and uh, bring the, the screen back up and put it in slideshow mode. And um, Paolo, take it away. Perfect, hi, hello everyone. And thank you, Kate, for interruption. Uh, yes, so as, uh, as you were saying, Kate, today I'm going to tell a little bit about how we could uh, uh, combine the uh, data from eye tracking glasses, from, for instance, from the super interesting study that Dr. Wagner has just described, and uh, add additional sensor data to it to get even more insights out of it. So we'll just, um, yes, we can go to the next slide, please. Perfect. Um, yes, so um, at iMotions, my main area of uh, interest is uh, what we would call mobile research. So that's any kind of research that happens outside of the lab. And uh, the use case, the study that Dr. Wagner had just presented is a prime example of that. Because of course, if you're studying actual uh, situations, uh, and in this case, in the medical interventions on, on patients, you want to do that in the field and not in, a, in an artificial environment of a, of a lab. So for that reason, uh, we want to work in, uh, within mobile research and that can cover, in fact, a number of fields uh, and different applications. Another reason why you might want to focus on, um, on mobile research, so taking your research outside of the lab, is uh, also just thinking about the ecological validity of the data you're collecting. So in, in many cases, in the environment of a lab, you might get different results than what you would uh, obtain in the real world. So that's one of the main reasons why you want to support uh, mobile research. 
So how do we do that in practice? Um, so of course, you have, uh, we have seen already uh, a very good example of how we can use eye tracking glasses and uh, the video recording with them in, um, to, to achieve that. But on top of that, uh, typically the devices and hardware we would use include smartphones, and those can be used both to collect sensor data from various uh, wearables, for instance, but also to provide interaction so the study participants in a mobile study would be able, for instance, to answer a questionnaire on the phone screen. And this way, we can capture their uh, immediate reaction to uh, whatever they are experiencing. And uh, yeah, I mentioned the wearable sensors. So you have a few examples here on the, on the slide. They could be uh, something like a heart rate band that you wear on your chest or a, a smartwatch. And all of these contribute to collecting various signals and data streams that then can be combined with the, the video and gaze data from the eye tracking glasses and provide even more insights. So we can go to the next slide, thank you. So here, um, yeah, I just want to show an example of uh, what we, one of the very important things to keep in mind when you want to take your research outside of the lab and that is to have uh, context. So uh, the graph that you see here shows heart rate data collected for a quite long period of time, 12 hours. And uh, if we just get that from wearable sensors, it's, it might be difficult to understand what really is going on with a study participant. So for that reason, uh, we always want to have a way to capture the context where data was collected. And we can go to the next Thank you. And you can see here one way to, to represent context. Uh, in this case, uh, I hope you can see on your screens the various annotations that have appeared below the, the graph. And they will, uh, for instance, highlight the time periods where the participant was at work, time periods where they were uh, at home or commuting or exercising and so on. And um, once we have that information, it's much easier to to figure out what is going on with heart rate and perhaps we can we're in a better position to infer why the heart rate might be higher or lower at a certain moment and uh, so um, here i have a, on, the, on the slide a few examples of other ways we can uh, establish context that could be based on location uh, audio video recordings could be self-reporting based on questionnaires but if we think back at the uh, training use case that we just so presented during the webinar, we can see how video from eye tracking glasses is a perfect way to add context to sensor data because uh, we get a first person perspective from the study participant, the person wearing the glasses, combined with the information about their visual attention, uh, where they were looking. And this way, we can more easily make the connection and perhaps correlate an increase in heart rate with something that we can observe in the video, perhaps a more difficult moment during the, the medical intervention. Yes, another aspect that uh, I think is very important, uh, again, thinking of uh, human behavior research and uh, here the, the training use case is a, is a prime example again, is uh, multimodality. So if we just were to collect data from one sensor, uh, let's think again of the example of the heart rate monitor, that might be difficult to interpret because there are many factors, many events uh, and circumstances that can influence the heart rate. And uh, the heart rate monitor just gives us that one information uh, of what the heart uh, rate was at a certain moment. So for that reason, we, we focus a lot on multimodality, meaning that we try to combine different uh, sensors and collect data from uh, all of them at the same time. And uh, so while, together with the heart rate, we might want to collect something the, like the skin conductance uh, or electrodermal activity, and that can add extra information on top of the heart rate and give, give us more uh, information and, and basis to understand the various processes that might be happening with the with the participant and uh, again to connect to the previous point together with uh, this multimodal data that we can collect 
we also always want to ensure that we have contextual information. And uh, in the picture here, we see again another frame from the from the study that Dr. Wagner has presented, where we have the both the video information and the gaze information collected with the eye tracking glasses. So um, perhaps just uh, one more point about multimodality is that, of course, it's um, the more sensors, the more information. But at the same time, there is a trade-off that I think is important to keep in mind. When we have more sensors together with potential for more data, we also introduce more risk for something uh, to go wrong during data collection, more things can malfunction or lose connection, or in general, it can be more difficult for the study participant to manage a large number of uh, sensors and have them on at the same time. So I think uh, when a researcher designs their uh, mobile study, it's very important to, to hit the right, uh, to strike the right balance between having enough sensors to capture the, the needed information, but not no more than uh, that, because we don't want to make it uh, too too difficult and difficult to manage for the study participant. Yes, and then finally, um, uh, I want to add a, a couple of comments about uh, the quantitative aspects of uh, mobile research, and in particular, what metrics can be useful here. So, from the in the previously uh, presented. Uh, uh, use case uh, by Dr. Wagner, we saw how the uh, data from the eye tracking glasses provided a lot of insight, a lot of information, uh, also in uh, the video based reflections that um, Dr. Wagner uh, mentioned. But um, the data there was mostly used in a, I would say, in a qualitative way, so to understand what was happening and give a first person perspective to the, to the viewers and be able to. To, to see precisely what the um, what the situation uh, looked like from the from the um, medical professionals' uh, point of view, but um, I think on a study like that, it's it would also be very valuable to add additional sensors to be able to capture the quantitative aspects. And one way to do that would be using heart monitoring. So um, that could be achieved wearing uh, something as simple as a heart rate band that is based on uh, uh, on ECG signal, uh, electrocardiography. And uh, I think that's uh, a very suitable uh, tool that could be used here because it's a very robust signal and that makes it uh, reliable in a real world context, such as the uh, training uh, use case that we were discussing. And at the same time, can provide very useful insight in uh, processes that uh, relate with uh, stress, uh, concentration, fatigue, cognitive workload, and more that might be happening in the in the person wearing the sensor. And uh, the way to do that is, uh, um, or one of the main ways to do that is uh, studying heart rate variability, which is uh, the measurement of the variation in the in the heart rhythm over time and changes in various aspects of uh, the, the heart rhythm can help us understand these various factors that might be stress uh, connected with stress or cognitive workload and in a context of training those can add extra information to what we see from the video by telling us in which moments during the during the training session the person wearing the sensor was more stressed or more um, concentrated or had higher cognitive workload. And uh, since we, uh, of course, we're talking about the, the glasses, another way to look at the data from the glasses in a more quantitative way would be to look at various metrics of visual attention. One way uh, might be uh, fixation analysis, typically based on the definition of uh, areas of interest. So if we look, think back at the uh, example from Dr. Wagner, one could uh, see, for instance, how often the um, person was looking at the monitors on the left side during the, during the intervention and uh, see if that changes by when they move, you move their, uh, their position in the room. Or uh, another metric that could be useful here is pupillometry, which studies the uh, change in the size of the, of the pupil 
and uh, again can be used to infer various information about stress or cognitive workload. Yes, uh, so yeah, these are just some considerations of uh, quantitative ways to address mobile research. And if you're interested in hearing more about uh, the emotions capabilities for mobile research, uh, feel free to ask questions or reach out to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paolo. Just turning my camera back on. Um, yeah, that was great. I'm uh, going to turn it back over to Victoria now um, really quickly. So we are going to learn a little bit more about the technical aspects of the VPS-19 glasses themselves. So uh, with that, I will turn my camera back off and Victoria, take it away. Uh, dear all, hello everyone. My name is Victoria Zikova. I'm the Senior Business Development Manager in the company Viewpoint System. And I'm very happy to discuss today uh, the added value for healthcare providers of our uh, smart classes in um, a very short introduction, maybe some of some of our tech specs. Um, very forward, very looking for your question afterwards. So please, next slide, Kate. Uh, so uh, the, the first of all, I would like to talk about the added value, right? So our system is extremely robust, so you can be sure that actually you can use our smart, smart glasses not only in the laboratory, but also in the field, right? We are very robust, so actually we can uh, work in any light conditions. I think it's extremely important, and we have seen that also in the study of Dr. Wagner. And uh, what can we do with our system? Uh, this is also unique because we can do the live stream and we can do the recordings at the same time. So you can use it in various applications areas uh, in accordance with your particular use case. Um, we also guarantee that your data will be safely saved. So um, our system is absolutely closed and you just can be sure that um, security is here. We assure you with that. Um, yes. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, first of all, so the system consists of two parts, as Dr. Wagner already uh, has said. Uh, the first part is the smart uh, glasses. Uh, they are very light. We wanted our technology uh, to be human-centered so that this 43 grams on your head would not disturb you uh, to work, especially in the very stressful conditions, as we saw from the study. Um, we provide you also with the with a microphone so then you could understand what was really going on uh, during all these situations. Um, maybe what is also very important that uh, we uh, have a front camera which is 13 megapixels and we are certified. We also have a safety glass in our glasses uh, which are also can be replaced with the optical lens if you would like to have that. Uh, if you don't want to use them, you can just uh, push out uh, the, the uh, lenses and then uh, our technology would also work. Uh, what is also extremely important, I think this is the, um, what the glasses are very comfortable to, bear, to wear and uh, they have a very uh, social acceptable design as we call it because it's very important that uh, you feel comfortable and it's very important that um, all other uh, patients or uh, your colleagues would just uh, um, see you uh, in normal way so so the design would be also acceptable from other people it's very important uh, the next slide please uh, so uh, the second part of the system is the smart unit so it's it's a it's a mini computer uh, what is unique about that one we have a multi-touch uh, surface we have a multi-touch display on the smart unit uh, we have also various certifications and due to that fact that we are streaming we have also various options to stream as you can see there on the right side we're working with a very high powerful computing chips as you can see here below and you can do with the, our storage is uh, with the storage you see here we can do more than 30 hours of videos which you can really store on the smart unit and afterwards uh, work with that um, on your computer uh, what is also unique that uh, this is our lifetime of the battery and how do you work with our system because uh, the lifetime of the battery is three hours, but it's not everything. We have an internal battery as well. And after three hours, you can proceed with hot swap. And actually that provides you an endless uh, 
unstoppable work because the system will not shut down when you change the battery. You have 15 minutes of time to change it, right? So this is very short introduction um, into some tech spec. Uh, very forward to your questions in a chat or afterwards, please feel free to reach out directly to me. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I'm just realizing that my screen is, uh, yes, there we go. Um, so yes, thank you, all of our presenters. You have really given us a, a full overview of the way that this data collection works. So we are almost ready for questions. Um, we have about 20 minutes left, so that's great. And if you, everyone could turn their cameras on, that would be great, and we can actually see you all. And uh, there you go. Uh, while we're waiting for that, I'm just going to uh, ask you all how we can follow up with you and then we'll get to the first question uh, because we would love to know if um, you're interested in iMotions or Viewpoint System, if we can contact you later either you know, with our newsletter or actually following up with a demo of our product, for example. So I'm just going to launch that and I hope you can see it. You can start answering those questions. Um, but while we do that, let's start the Q&A. So our first question is Dr. Wagner for Dr. Wagner. And we have Ravali who is wondering if you have also recorded the video information of the expert performing the task, so the third person view, do you think adding this video information could help the trainees learn better as they could view both the first person and the third person view? How would you tackle that? Um, sorry, I just cannot see you anymore. I, try. I still see the, the question. But not yes. the, the videos. Okay, yeah, so however, however <clears throat> uh, so the question was if we combine like first person perspective and if like a, uh, a room perspective, if yeah. that would be of educational benefit, is it right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, so we are doing that, and I, I definitely think that this gives an uh, additional educational benefit. It's just very difficult to. You, you need someone who is helping you with video cutting so uh, to really find um, the spot where where like the eye tracking video and the room video is is starting and then merge them together but it's possible we are doing it and it's very beneficial we get very awesome. good feedback on that yeah that's great um, okay I can see that most the majority of people have actually entered this poll already so I'm going to close it and uh, we'll get to the next question so next question is um, also for Dr. Wagner do you think that it's possible to reach your same results with for example smart glasses so this question sort of um, wouldn't necessarily be possible with the iMotions platform because you wouldn't be able to bring non-native sensors that we integrate with into the platform to do sort of for example what Paolo mentioned a fixation analysis but just hypothetically do you think that you could reach the same result with something like uh, smart glasses? Um, that's a good question. I think so. Yeah, I think that that, that should be possible. I, I haven't tried it, but I, I guess it uh, should give you same uh, uh, same results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think what's uh, what's great about the viewpoint system glasses as well is that you have the fixation detection right there. Um, and Victoria, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit, but I, I love that you can actually like understand exactly where people are looking. I'm not so familiar with smart glasses, but there's definitely, and also there's high degree of accuracy with the VPS-19. Would you yeah, mind sure, not just, get Just a quick follow up on that. I, I definitely, it, it always depends on what you would like. So I think uh, you can use the, the viewpoint system glasses without the, the, the visual fix, fixation. So the white circle and you can still do the video recording so it depends on if you want to do just qualitative or also quantitative analysis so i think it's it's very nice because you can really identify the focus when using eye tracking but uh, both is possible i think it always depends on your research question basically but victoria maybe you can see more about it Yes, I mean, uh, I, I would, you know, in this case, what we have, uh, what we have uh, seen presented by uh, Dr. Wagner uh, for the healthcare providers, uh, I'm absolutely, I absolutely agree with that because um, actually depends on your research questions. What we also have experienced from our customers from various industries that do both, and then they compare, and then they 
see how does it help or um, how does it elaborate. Um, um, uh, for example, if it's a training session, then um, it's almost incredible uh, what kind of impact does it have on the final results. Because uh, actually we know that uh, the um, attention is uh, directly uh, connected to the eye tracking technology. So, and that gives us actually um, the whole you know the the whole information sometimes we think that we um not only see but we also um uh, are consuming the information but in, in in most of the situation it's not like that so i think with the eye tracking you can exactly understand what's going on and um uh, the person who is wearing the glasses then have a direct feedback with himself or herself um, I think it's 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 an added value um, um, because we do it unconsciously. So it's it, it's I think it's a unique eye tracking technology is unique method to open this door to your unconscious um, unconscious uh, uh, decision making process, right? And in the stressful situation, I think is one of the most effective ways and uh, most effective tools to analyze that because in these situations you don't have that much time and you can an analyze the situations in in most of the um uh, most of the uh, uh cases just afterwards right so you cannot take too much time in the situation you you have to think about it afterwards that would be my sub uh, subjective opinion on that thank you my um okay i have another question for dr wagner from Oliver who asks, did the participants of the scenarios, either real or simulation, were wearing the eye tracker feel a little awkward or even compromised during the debriefing when all others could see their first person view video recordings and maybe could even experience the stress and discomfort the participant had in the hot seat during the intervention? Did you have any sort of uh, acknowledgement of nerves afterwards during the intervention and uh, the debriefing? Um, that's a very interesting question. Actually, we we never really asked, uh, like uh, we never asked the participants in a structured way, but we never got a feedback that it was like strange for them. Uh, what we always hear is that the participants don't like to hear their voices. So when we do when we watch recordings with just seeing their first person perspective, it's not a big deal. But if you add uh, sound to it, then it sometimes it's not really a problem, but it's like awkward for participants usually. That's super interesting. Yeah, and there are uh, there is that recording, that audio recording capability with the glasses, so uh, <laughs> it is captured. <laughs> um, yes, now a question um, about peopleometry. So I think this might be for Paolo. Can we use peopleometry in mobile studies without controlling for the light and other factors that may influence the diameter of the pupil? Right. Um, yes, I think that's a very good question. And uh, um, I would say it again comes to the kind of trade offs that I was mentioning before. So, of course, for uh, optimal um, measurement and optimal condition for pupillometry, you would be in a lab, you would control for light conditions in the room and uh, try to remove all these factors. Uh, at the same time, if you want to do research, for instance, on a uh, training use cases where you want to be out in the real world, uh, that's not necessarily always possible. Uh, so that, uh, again, it's about striking a balance between uh, the data quality and what the circumstances and the, and the setting for the, for the study would allow. So in this case, if, you, uh, if somebody wanted to do pupillometry in a real world context, then uh, my approach would be to have a best effort uh, uh, approach to controlling the light and the and light conditions in the in the room where the experiment happens but also accept that there might be confounding factors introduced by the light that could not be controlled optimally and uh, yeah perhaps uh, if there are more considerations about the uh, how this technically can be achieved with the glasses i, I don't know if victoria wants to supplement the answer Well, as I said, uh, we are extremely like we are extre extremely flexible in in different light conditions. Um, comes for sure um, to the situation where you are. So, what kind of light is it? 
sometimes it's very dark and then you have only uh, LEDs, like small LEDs in operation room or something like that. Um, in this case, uh, we are also working on various options. So we also have the opportunity to adjust uh, uh, our software to various conditions. So it is something maybe to discuss also what is going to come next with the next software updates, but also we are flexible enough to adjust ourselves uh, to um, to um, particular uh, healthcare provider if we know exactly the conditions. It's it's a very it is a fantastic topic and it gives us a lot of energy to to develop further because we would like to be customized and this is something um, one of our um, most important uh, features I said I, I would say um, of our of our product that we would like also to be extremely customized for everyone. Great, thank you for that question. Okay, we have 10 minutes left, so if you want to ask a question, make sure you get it into the chat ASAP. Um, okay, I have a question from Arno who writes, how to use eye tracking for surgeries requiring surgical loops? Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, maybe that is for Dr. Can you say it again? Sorry, it uh, had some connection problem. Yes, uh, Arno is asking, how would you use eye tracking for surgery requiring surgical loops? And that's spelled L-O-U-P-E-S. Uh, to be honest, I don't know what 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 is what you mean with surgical loops. Does anyone else here know in the group? Uh, I, I'm not a sur I'm not a surgeon, so I, I I cannot answer that. Yeah, so Arno, if you want to um, elaborate on that question, that would be great. And just put it in the chat, and we'll we'll queue it up. Okay, so moving on to the next question, which is a little bit more technical. So um, we're using eye tracking in the context of virtual reality medical trainings. Often the trainings are developed by partners and they often can't include the iMotions SDK into the projects. Is there a way of including the raw eye tracking data in iMotions post hoc? And if we do a video recording of the VR view of the participant. Um, so Paolo, do you think you can take that one? So if I understood the question correctly, is about importing uh, glasses data. Uh, yes, so um, yeah, I would say for, uh, again, it, uh, I, I didn't catch if uh, what type of glasses the uh, person asking the question. Um, it, it's in VR medical training. Okay, right. Um, yes, but I think the general answer is that uh, iMotions offers various ways to import uh, data after the study. So we have all the various post import uh, capabilities, uh, as we would call them. So um, yeah, if there is a concrete use case and, and concrete uh, uh, hardware device that they are using, I would encourage the person to, to reach out to figure out the technicalities, but uh, in, in many cases, that is possible. Great, and actually another question for you, Paolo. Um, is it possible to in integrate near-infrared spectroscopy, sorry, spectroscopy, <laughs> NIRS, basically, as a, a, a physiologic metric in multimodal mobile research? So just to answer that one quickly, Paolo, you can elaborate. Um, but we do not uh, integrate with NIRS, uh, especially in mobile. Um, but maybe Paolo can answer more about why. Uh, yes. So I think there were uh, maybe two parts to the answer. One depends on the on the hardware. So we are, um, in general, in iMotions, we are an integration platform. So uh, we integrate devices and sensors that are available on the market in, into our software and take care of all the various aspects of time synchronization. So for that to happen in mobile research, uh, it's uh, necessary to have an, an nearest device that is uh, developed for this kind of use cases. And um, I must say it's not. Uh, yeah, we haven't. We are not aware of uh, devices that offer that. On the other hand, uh, new devices, new sensors appear in the market every day, so uh, it's something that could be possible in the future. If we're thinking more of our lab-based uh, use cases, our desktop software, um, often an option uh, if you want to use devices that are not directly supported might be to use our uh, live API to stream data into iMotions, but that uh, will require some programming capabilities on the on the researcher's side. Yes, exactly. But yeah, the the takeaway for that is that we uh, are pretty flexible at iMotions, so um, please come to us. Our technical expertise is pretty broad. Uh, we have tons of people on staff who have PhDs in human behavior research, neuroscience, um, so we have tons of experience. So if you're 
curious about a project that may or may not fit with iMotions, just reach out to us and um, you can email us at marketing at iMotions.com and we'll make sure to, yeah, tackle your use case with all of our <laughs> might. Um, okay, we're running out of time quickly, so I want to ask... One, one um, thing I would like to come back to the other question because I just looked up yeah. what, what surgical loops are. Uh, I, I thought like of video loops or so, but I think what the person actually meant was like glasses with a magnifier. Yeah, so. Exactly. Yeah, so that's we did that. So that's possible. You can do that sometimes. It depends a little bit on the loops. And um, what you cannot do is eye tracking. So you, you you just cannot measure it because sometimes you need to put the eye tracking glasses over the loops and and it's just not fitting well. But you can still do the first person recording sometimes. Awesome. That's really good to know. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, Okay, so two last questions. Um, the first one is when videoing actual patients, how do you gain patient slash parent consent for participation, Dr. Wagner? So we have, uh, we asked our institutional review board if we can do the study, we do that in a research setting only, and we ask all the parents uh, if it's okay for, uh, for them if we use the videos and if we use um, the gained data for research, and then it's basically fine. It's difficult outside of a research project, to be honest. Yes, it's true. Always go through the IRB. It's very important. Okay, great. And last question before we wrap up. So um, uh, this is a question for Paolo. If we are talking about data collected outdoors or within buildings outside of the lab condition, which quantitative data is viable to collect with eye tracking glasses? Right. Um, yeah, so I think it will depend on a specific use case. I think a, a kind of data that is often helpful is uh, uh, heart monitoring, especially, well, I, I would say both ECG-based as a chest strap or uh, PPG-based, so uh, typically a, a wristband or smartwatch. Both of them are, uh, I think, strike a really good balance between a signal that is uh, strong and robust enough to be, to be stable and reliable in a real-world context, and at the same time, provide a lot of insight about physiological processes that might be happening. And uh, again, going back to uh, stress, cognitive workload, fatigue, and of course, uh, all that is related to exercise where heart rate itself is a, is a very interesting metric. So um, without knowing anything about the use case, I would, as a first uh, thought, consider heart monitoring as a, as a signal to be measured in a, in a real world context. Awesome. Yeah. And um, just in terms of eye tracking glasses data as well, you can do any sort of analysis that Paolo mentioned during his slides. Um, for example, a fixation analysis or AOI. Um, uh, oops, sorry about that. Um, AOI, uh, areas of interest analyses. So for example, if you have several different participants in the same sort of outdoor condition, aggregating their data and making areas of interest that then you aggregate across all of your participants, you can sort of analyze the, the fixations and the, the a visual attention of multiple participants within eye tracking, eye tracking glasses. So that is super interesting. But um, yeah, on that note, we are out of time. So I would like to thank you so much for participating in this webinar. And if we didn't get to your question, please email us at marketing at imotions.com and we will be sure to distribute it to the appropriate person, whether it's Victoria, Paolo, or Dr. Wagner. And um, yeah, I just want to say thank you as well to our presenters for this really interesting talk and we covered a lot of ground today. So appreciate it and thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day.